Um, thank the organizers for inviting me. It's an exciting conference. Okay. Okay. So um, it's the first time for me and also for my colleagues to attend this conference, so it's very exciting. But um, as uh, the chair already uh, introduced, um, the field has come a long way. And so where we're actually coming from is from neurological diseases. So we work in the neurological clinics. And um, so I've worked on CNS disorders and TCR repertoires for longer than I care to say. And, <laughs> but you all know that, um, I mean, we've worked on many diseases that you can see here, and I will talk a little bit more about this later on. But um, what we did uh, 10 years ago, and I just wanted to put that up as an example, is um, we didn't really look at repertoires. We looked at a couple of sequences and a couple of peaks that we could find from, you know, gels and we could cut out and clone. And so, um, it's funny that basically 10 years ago, this, this paper uh, um, was published by us and what uh, we looked at, and it's, it's an important topic as ever, so this is a very rare um, pediatric disease, it's an epilepsy, uh, which is unihemispheric and basically the only way to, you know, to, to, to remedy this is to remove the affected hemisphere. And you can see a child here after surgery where you can see that half of the brain is basically missing. And so those are very, very severe diseases. And so this is why we've been working on this for so long. But 10 years ago, this was a very descriptive thing that we did very phenotypically in a couple of sequences. And we couldn't really quantify it. I mean, we could find some sequences and show them to our readers, but this was not really a quantification or a scientific analysis like we can do now with the with millions of sequences that we have. But um, what I want to talk to you in the first part of my talk is um, how the HLA shapes the TCR repertoire. So we've heard a lot about antibodies and I want to talk about um, TCR receptors a little bit. And um, you all know that um, the HLA presents the antigen and the T cell has a TCR receptor and depending on which HLA background you have, your T cell receptor repertoire will be shaped immensely. And um, there are very nice papers in, in very high ranking journals that have looked at this, and we could see the same thing in our data as well. Um, but before we started our study, which is about um, sex bias, and I talked about this yesterday a little bit, we had to do a lot of adjustments because we combined many studies, studies that, you know, data that we've done ourselves, but also data in the public domain. And um, what we ended up is we had to correct for all these things in the data sets that we've gathered. And um, some of them are obvious, some of them are less obvious. So of course, you will have batch effects. Of course, you will have differences between cDNA and gDNA, between PBMC, CD4, CD8. Those are things you would actually, you know, think about before you conduct a study. But some of the things like, for example, sequencing depth, and I think we've already talked about this a lot in the last couple of days, is something that actually influences your, your data structure enormously. And I don't have an answer yet on how to rectify this because what you can do is you can take your worst sample and then cut everything off there, but then you lose a lot of your data and you don't want to do this. But you also can't infer what would happen below the surface in those samples. So it is, it's an unanswered question basically. And what we also had to adjust for if we could is for age, ethnicity and disease status. But um, this is basically, and I like the slide because it's basically the result of our paper. And um, what we found is that um, HLA influences your TCR repertoire. Everyone knows that. But there are quite a few instances where the HLA in women 
influences your TCR repertoire in a divergent reaction than it does in men. So it can be that in this case, men and women are actually A26 positive, but men will have less of this V beta chain and women will have more. And there are many instances of these, uh, inst uh, you know, these shifts that you can see. And if you think about the, the pathology be behind everything, um, this is an important point. You might not know that, but you know, men are more prone to infectious diseases and cancer. Women are more prone to autoimmune diseases, like very broadly speaking, there are always exceptions. But thinking about this and thinking about that there are diseases that have high HLA associations, but have a very, very large sex disparity between them. It is an interesting finding, and I think it's an important finding that this can happen, because we wouldn't have thought that it would. I mean, we, we wanted to ask the scientific question, but we were surprised that it's actually that way. And if you look at a little bit of a broader scale, and um, I hope you can read a little bit, so here we have different HLAs, here we have different V-beta chains, and everywhere where you see color, there are significant differences between the sexes. So either it goes up in one sex and down in the other, or just stays the same in one and goes up in the other. So those are the significant differences that we found. And um, we had a very interesting revision time with this uh, paper. So it took us almost a year to satisfy all the statistical you know, questions from the reviewers. And one of them we actually found very interesting. So there is a possibility, and this has been published for, um, for gene expression studies, where you can find hidden covariates in your data. And so you can put in your known covariates so it's basically this old Rumsfeld thing, right? The known knowns and the known unknowns and these kinds of things. So um, basically, those are the things that you know influence your data. And then there's a cut. And then the algorithm tells you, well, there are actually a couple of other things that might influence your data as well. You should correct for them. And so we also put them uh, into our models. But those are things that you don't really think about, but in, you know, especially if you work in the clinics, you, you know these things. So, for example, a patient always comes in on Monday or another patient always comes in on Friday. So this will be a, co a confounder in your data that you don't really know about because the one is rested from the weekend, the one is stressed from the week. Or one study nurse only works on Wednesdays and she's very rough with the patients, you know, and so the cells are stressed. You know, and so those are things you don't know about as a researcher because you, you get the blood and you, you do all your experiments, but they can influence your data nonetheless. So I think that was a very interesting um, process that we had to go through. And you can see that in the sensitivity analysis with these covariates added. Um, so the, the findings still hold up, but it is, important to keep that in mind when you look at your data and especially when you combine data um, from different studies where you don't really know all the confounders. And uh, we then moved on and said, okay, so there's this difference, uh, and there's the sex bias, but we wanted to go a little bit deeper. So not as deep you know, as probably some of you go uh, into the sequencing data, but we always uh, asked ourselves, with uh, also pertaining to the talk that we've just heard with what is important, CDR3 regions, V betas, CDR1, 2, so what is actually going on? We uh, looked at the known um, CDR1 and 2 of the V beta chains that were in our, in our experiments, and we said, well, how similar or how different are they to each other? Because those should be the regions that bind to the HLA whereas the CDR3 mostly binds to the antigen. And so after, um, afterwards, we, we did a um, similarity matrix and clustered them. And uh, for one thing which was nice is that clustered were um, the families, how they are in IMGT. So the IMGT actually is right, <laughs> which, is, which is nice. But you know what they did back then when they did gave the names to the families is they looked at nucleotide identity and said, well, 
if they are more than, for example, 80% identical, they should belong to the same family. And this is a very reasonable thing to do. But 20% difference can make a lot of difference when you look at, at amino acids. So if every third one is, is different, you might have a completely different amino acid. So looking at the amino acid similarities and finding that the families still grouped together was actually nice you know, as a, as a control. But what we did then is we went into our study and we looked at expansions of the beta chains inside the same individual. And we could find that the more, you know, if two V beta chains are very similar to each other, they will expand in unison in a certain individual. And if they are very different from each other, there will be a strong negative Spearman correlation. So, um, which makes sense, you know, if an HLA fits very well to one CDR3, uh, CDR1 region, you know, it might also expand cells that have a similar CDR1 region. But if they are completely different, then the HLA and CDR binding will be different as well. And um, then we came back uh, with that knowledge to our data set and looked at um, you know, regions that are, have low similarity, low blossom similarity and high. And we looked at men and women again, because this was the topic of our paper. And what we could find is that if you have a high similarity, so a high uh, blossom count, basically. Men and women behaved, uh, basically, if uh, those are CD4, so those are CD8s, in healthy people, they behaved very similarly. But if you looked at people with autoimmune diseases in CD8 cells, and this was mainly the topic of our paper, so MHC1 and CD8 cells, um, in low similarity, there was a difference which means that in men with autoimmune diseases, so mostly in men, um, cells co-expand even though their uh, CDR1 and 2 region don't really match as well to the HLA. So they are overeager, basically. They expand when they shouldn't be. You know, and basically, biologically, you should only have expansions when they have high similarity. But you can see here, that especially in autoimmune diseases, this seems to be a little bit different. And when we then went to step back and looked at clonality as a very broad measure of uh, clonal disturbance in a sample, and we did um, age and sex matching, basically, uh, we could find that in CD4 cells, you don't really see much. But in CD8 cells of healthy donors, there's no difference. And in CDL8 cells of people with autoimmune diseases, so multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis, you can see that the men have a way higher clonality. And this is probably due to the fact that they can co-expand even though they shouldn't be in CD8 cells. And uh, this was just something we did as a control. We looked at memory and naive cells and could find that this is true for um, expansion and selection. So selection in the thymus and expansion in the periphery. So this works the same way. So this has nothing to do with, with uh, expansion itself. So this seems to be a biological phenomenon from the start. And so this is the end of the first part of my talk. And you can either ask questions here or questions afterwards. So the HLA alleles, they modulate expression of V-beta chains. I think that was known pretty well. The V-beta chains can be associated with the defense against pathogens or development of autoimmunity. And while the HLA alleles are not different between the sexes, the development of autoimmunity and defense against pathogens are. And so the HLA association studies and other studies that look at these kinds of things, they should be interpreted in conjunction with sex. So things where you want to look at these, uh, you know, situations, you should divide by sex beforehand and only compare women, like healthy and diseased, or only compare men, or rigorously control for this, you know, statistically, because there are many, many differences in the expansion of, of T cells in men and women. We are looking uh, in our lab, as I said, uh, we are looking into diseases of the central nervous system in neurological diseases. And those are the three areas that we're currently working on. So we're working on MS, which is you know, 
predominantly T cell mediated, but also, you know, there are also some um, B cell findings, of course. You have a strong HLA uh, drive. I already talked about Rasmussen's encephalitis, which is also very, you know, it's, a, uh, it's an interest of ours, has been for a long time, and we have a large collection of samples, of biosamples and of sequences that we can work with. And PML, so that is a progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. That's a virus-mediated disease of the brain that can happen during immune suppression, so mostly during HIV infection. And we also have a large collection and a large interest to look at the immune reaction against the mediating virus, which is the um, JC polyoma virus. And now we come to the problem. So um, we want to look at all these things. Of course, all of us do. But uh, we're getting to a point where this gets very, very difficult to do with local installations of software with computers that might be two years old. So um, if we want to look at over a thousand samples and over you know, a billion sequences and motifs, we do need smart out of memory approaches. And I think all of you probably know this much better than I do. It's just something we're struggling with. And uh, because we want to look at all of these uh, people at the same time, we can't do it one by one. We need to have them all into the same data space to actually see what's the same and what's different. And if you, you know, perturb this with the HLA background that you have, different diseases and healthy controls, this gets really, really messy really fast. And you only, not only want, as I already told you, to look at one feature, which would be like the bioidentity of the sequence, but you want to look at many, many features of your sequencing data. And so you get to a point where you have a multidimensional input that already gets so large, even for one sample, that you can't really look at 1,000 samples at the same time. And so what we currently do, and this is, you know, it's a work in progress, um, we have kind of a data hub where we use uh, SAS in the middle, and then we kind of pack our data packages and, you know, put them into other, uh, you yeah. know, programs, dimensions, other, um, you know, programming, programming languages. And we're trying to figure out, you know, what's happening in our data. And if some of you have suggestions how to improve this, you can, you know, um, come to me and, and tell me all about it. I mean, I've already heard a couple of things the last days, but many people either say they do things, you know, one by one and just want to, you know, fasten it, which is fine, you know, but then you can do look, can look at everything at once, or you can go to Amazon, which is also something, depending on the privacy laws that you have and when you work with patient data, which might not really be, you know, seen with the, you know, <laughs> your legal experts in your clinics might not want that. Let's put it this way. And so we have started working with all the tools that you guys have programmed, and this is just one example. And I, I'm very excited about, you know, PGEN and, and these things that now come up because they give you a chance of evaluating how common a sequence is just by looking at it. And I think that's a wonderful, you know, improvement that you can actually look at small sample sizes and still say, okay, what's strange in those? And um, this is also just, we're just beginners in machine learning and deep learning. So we started with something that we knew would work and worked our way up from there. And so this is just where we, uh, we used um, HLA DRB115, which is NMS risk allele. And we wanted to see, okay, how well do these features perform in predicting HLA DRB115? And you can see that, you know, depending on the sequencing depth that you use, you get different accuracies depending on which features you use. And the goal would, of course, be to use all of these features and to move from shallow networks to deep network to improve performance. But this is rather tricky, especially uh, if the data space is already so large to begin with. Open questions. So I have a, a lot of open questions and I would be happy if some of them could be answered during those couple of days that we still have. So sequencing depth is one of my pet peeves. So I think that this is so important and this is so frustrating 
work with samples with different sequencing depth between experiments, between cohorts or whatever, artifacts that you might find, primer bias that you might have. You always have too few patients, but you always have too many samples at once. So it's also a conundrum that we have. And um, what I also would like to have are validated approaches to tackle some of these things. Something where you know, whoops, this would have to work. So if this doesn't work in my data set, I don't have to move on. I have to get this done. Kind of like not only data standards, but approaches standards that you say, okay, if I can't get my data set to do this, I don't have to move on. I have to get this done first. So I would like to have something like that. And what, of course, the community has worked on a lot is nomenclature and data structure. I think that is hugely important because otherwise you spend 80% of your time converting from one format to the other and not doing science. Um, this is kind of the last slide that I want to present. I have no idea what my time is, but I hope it's rather okay. Um, you will get these slides, I think, as a PDF. So if you can't read this, don't worry. Um, this is kind of our, you know, I, we don't have this printed out on the wall, but this is something kind of that we're working towards. So we are working with biobanks all over the world and we're gathering CNS samples, CNS tissue samples, and look at um, T cell receptor repertoires in there in many different neurological diseases that I have, some of them I've written on here. And we want to answer the questions that all of you want to answer in your project. So is this a primary immune response? Is this secondary to another trauma that someone had? Can I find uh, sequences that can be used as selection biomarkers, which is hugely important for the pharmaceutical industry, but also for, you know, to construct clinical trials? Can I look at antigen specificity, at common pathology between different kinds of uh, diseases? So all of these things we want to do, but we're, you know, even like 15 years after, we're still at the very beginning but I'm beginning to hope that this might, might change soon. I want to uh, thank all these people and thank you for, you for your attention and come visit us in Münster. Uh, you're welcome to visit us and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. So questions? Yes. Could you go into a little more detail on the data that you were using? You were saying you gathered 800 and some odd samples from different sources. I'd love to understand where you got those and, and you mentioned some of the challenges of normalizing them. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, so we got uh, many of those from the adaptive immune access, but um, we also basically scoured the web and looked at where do we find publications that have published data, then can we use them? Are they in a, in a quality that we can use? Are they in a format that we can use? And then we incorporated them all into big databases, basically, you know, local databases onto our own computers. But this was, this was a struggle, but you know, you, you have to basically do a lot of data exploration. You have to download the data and then look at it and see, okay, things that I know I have to see, do I see them here? Or things that I know how they should look like, how, they, how do they look like here? And if it looks just really different from your data, you will have to discard it. But if there is a chance, you can use statistical you know, adjustments to kind of incorporate them into your study. At least um, if you want to look at very rough estimates, like, I mean, we only used in this case, V beta chain percentages. I think if you go down to uh, like sequence identity, this will be even trickier, but yeah, you have to try. In the first part of your talk, I wasn't sure if you were referring mostly to peripheral expansion after antigen exposure or clonal selection during thymic development yeah. uh, or, or both. Was it so we uh, mostly, I mean, we always looked at peripheral blood. So we, in a way, we looked at uh, peripheral expansion, but during the review process, the reviewer asked us, well, 
is this a peripheral expansion thing or is this already happening in the thymus? And so we then started just to do control experiments with uh, completely naive or antigen experienced cells and see um, if the ratios of the beta chains are stable. And, um, you know, so, and they were. So we assume that the HLA bias or the HLA association starts basically very early, but it is continuously so. So if you have an HLA that is prone to like V-beta-13, for example, you will already have a lot of V-beta-13 in your thymus then, and you will keep that during the expansions and the antigen experience and everything. And it's just the way your HLA likes to you know, collaborate with certain V-betas and don't like as much others. Yeah, okay. And do you take into account peptide diversity? peptide repertoire and how that might differ between males and females? Um, no. <laughs> so we, we have not, yeah. I mean, you, of course you will have um, peptides, you will have, um, let's say, antigen structures that are different in, in males and females, of course. I mean, you have different hormones and everything. But um, I think um, when you look at the same uh, HLA backgrounds, so when you kind of break it down to the same ba uh, HLA background, um, you will not be able to see the same V-beta expanded in the same HLA if this is about antigens, because I think it's more about the CDR1 and 2 region, which should not be as antigen dependent as the CDR3. I think as soon as you move into the CDR3, you're completely right. Then you get this whole mess of you know, different antigen exposures. But I think as CDR1 and 2 are mainly responsible for the binding of HLA and, and V-beta, I think it's not as important, but it's of course a confounder that we have. I think we've got time for one more question. Thank you. That was a really interesting talk, and I, you're you're raising some really important points about these biases and and things that we struggle with our own data as well. And and the sex differences in particular. There's so many immunological differences, of course. Um, I wonder if you could clarify one thing. Uh, something that really jumped out at me was that the three HLA alleles that you highlighted as having strong sex biases are the HLA types that have very different subtypes. So A6801 and A6802 present fundamentally different motifs, and same among the B15 groups. Are these sex biases, do they hold at the four-digit level as well? Um, that's a good question. So with this study, we only had um, two-digit information, but we now got a larger data set with four-digit information, and we reproduced this, and so this still holds. But I still would like uh, to repeat all of these analyses, actually, when we have a larger data set with four-digit information, and to replicate it and seeing what holds and what doesn't. But I think... On, on average, on the finding itself, it should, but there might be some switches and some HLAs that you know don't hold or some that pop up if you have four digit information. I think both will happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nicholas.